Hello and welcome to Popcorn Mumbles, the podcast where we dig into the back catalog to select a film or television show to rewatch. I'm your host, Cody Nestor. Alongside me is my co-host, Todd Hill. What's going on, guys? This week we have chosen the 1964 film Goldfinger. The powerful tycoon Auric Goldfinger has initiated Operation Grand Slam, a cataclysmic scheme to raid Fort Knox and obliterate the world economy. James Bond, armed with a specially equipped Aston Martin, must stop the plan by overcoming several outrageous adversaries. Goldfinger was released in the U.S. on December 22, 1964. On a budget of $3 million, it made $125 million. It has a Rotten Tomatoes score of 99% and an audience score of 89%. So, Todd, let's discuss Goldfinger. Spoilers are ahead. Okay. So, Todd, uh, let's start off. What is, uh, what is James Bond's assignment this time around? So, uh, basically, uh, we get the kind of... The uh, pre-credits teaser, which doesn't have anything to do with the movie. The first, uh, <laughs> the first instance of that, uh, right. o- the opening credit scene having nothing to do with the actual narrative of the rest of the film that kind of give the producers a way to kind of get us right into the action and then introduce us to what's going on with Jimmy Bond and his adventures uh, more in a more mellow way after right. that opening credit scene. So basically we pick him up. Uh, he's in Miami. Uh, he kind of thinks he's on maybe a little bit of a vacation, but he runs into his old pal Felix Leiter. And he lets him know that uh, he wants to keep an eye on a guy that's staying there called Auric Goldfinger. They kind of got, you know, suspicions Sounds like a French nail varnish, Todd. (laughs) That's what Jimmy thinks anyway. So they kind of, you know, they want him to keep an eye on him. They kind of, the government's kind of got their suspicions of him. Uh, We see Goldfinger come down. Uh, Lighter tells him that there's this guy he's been cleaning out every day at cards, uh, you know, just wiping him out playing gin. Uh, James is a little bit suspicious of that. He kind of realizes Goldfinger's got a setup up in his room. He kind of makes his way up there, forces a maid to open the door for him. Yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, goes in and sees uh, Goldfinger's accomplice, uh, Jill Masterson. And mm. Jill's kind of, she's cheating with Goldfinger. She's watching the other guy's hand, you know, telling Goldfinger what he's playing. Uh, Bond puts a quick stop to that. I love how he, he kind of flicks the mic, <laughs> messes up Goldfinger's here, and like, right. attention, Goldfinger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then uh, pretty much from there, he has a nice little uh, evening with Jill, I right, would say. Right. Uh, uh, takes a little break from their activities to go uh, get another chilled bol- uh, bottle of, was it, was it uh, Dom Perignon? Dom Perignon. Uh, and uh, ends up getting a little Judy chop to the uh, to the back of the head by right. uh, Goldfinger's henchman that we'll come to see later. Odd job. Uh, I guess first off, Todd, what is it? I know this is your favorite Bond film, right? It's my personal favorite, yes. So what is it that makes Goldfinger your favorite Bond film? For me personally, I think you've kind of, you've built a strong foundation with Dr. No from Russia with Love. I think for me personally, you've hit the apex of the series right here. And in a way, it's a little bittersweet because you're kind of leaving behind some of the just pure espionage spy stuff. And you're kind of crossing over into super spy territory now. Right. But I think Goldfinger, maybe more than any other of the Bond films, kind of walks that line perfectly. Yeah. It's also <laughs> it's also a little sad, too, because it, it's a little bit diminishing returns from here. Right. For... A number of years, I think. I haven't went. We haven't went back and watched Thunderball yet. That's our, that's our next up for Bonjuary. But uh, uh, I don't remember uh, too much about how I felt about Thunderball. But I know getting into some of the later Conneries. Obviously, we got a, uh, a George Lazenby coming up as right, well. Right. A little uh, a little sidetrack into Lazenby territory. But yeah, it's a little bit sad too because we hit our, th- our apex in the third movie, and then we slowly go down for a while. Yeah, and you kind of you start to get. Right here in Goldfinger, you kind of get sort of the final pieces of the template that exactly. kind of defines this series, I would say, at least through the Brosnan era. Yeah, because this time we really, I think, this time we really solidify those opening credits. Right. We've got an actual, we've got Shirley Bassey this time actually belting out the Goldfinger, yeah. um, your main title track and the opening credits. We have it, uh, it very good opening credits. Like, you know, again, we kind of get that little bit of that from Russia with Love Vibe where the kind of uh, the f- scenes of the things we haven't seen yet are kind of projected onto our golden ladies. Right, right. But yeah, we kind of nail down the opening credits. We talked about it kind of nails down the pre opening credits like having nothing to do with it just big action set piece exactly to get us in there obviously we'll talk about it later on but we we get the car oh yeah <laughs> uh we get more, a little bit more quippy this time 
There's a yeah. few a few other kind of quips and stuff, but it, we get also we have the main heavy, and then we have like the mini boss because right. we have you know Goldfinger as our main, and then we have his really the first henchman. Like in the Bond films, like you go back to From Russia with Love, you had Red Grant, but he's he's not really so much. I mean, he is a henchman, but he's really he's just another spy. He's just another man doing a job. Right. Whereas Odd Job, he's your first kind of henchman in exactly. the vein of like a Jaws, and the 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 characters we'll kind of see later. So it does lay that groundwork for like some of the best things. And we got we get more gadgets here than ever. Yeah. From from you know Q coming in compared to From Russia with Love, which was mostly just a briefcase and. Dr. No, which was just barely anything, a Geiger counter and, and something else, you know. So it yeah. really does lay that foundation, like you said. Um, talking about the opening credits, what what is the better opening credits? Dr. No from Russia with Love or this? You know, I'm probably going to have to go Goldfinger here. Right. <laughs> That's pretty it's, – it's the first one I think that is really – I mean, I love the Dr. No opening credits. I think they are really good. From Russia with Love, I think, are, are decent and good as well, but I think this Goldfinger one is iconic. I think it's a lot to do with Shirley Bassey. Yeah. I mean, Shirley Bassey can, like, you know, sing a menu and win, win two Grammys. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, it really does. It adds something. Like, you know, the first two were just kind of inter- you know, instrumental, and, I mean, they're great, but, like, having that, it's just you associate Bond opening credits with someone kind of, you know, having a, a good – you know, belting out a good number, and yeah. Goldfinger is still one of the best out of the twenty plus Bond films that yeah. we have. Belting out a song and holding a note to almost to the point of blacking it. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Apparently, her and um, Tom Jones right. had the same kind right. of experience right. uh, in Thunderball. Next, um, l- let's talk about a little bit of the gadgets because I want to hit on one here. But uh, our kind of our gadgets in this in this film, uh, the first one we see. Uh, and I totally forgot about is the seagull headgear. Seagull, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, I didn't, I didn't really think about what it was. I, when I wrote my notes originally, I was like, waterfowl headgear. I was like, <laughs> oh, it's a seagull. <laughs> seagull headgear uh, and the grapple gun is what he uses. He's basically in um, somewhere in, I guess, South America. I guess blowing Looks up like uh, it, some yeah. kind of drug operation is really right. again doesn't really transfer over to the, the actual main story. Did you notice the grapple gun? It looks a little weird when he fires it. Did you notice that? He like points it, it fires, and then the rope comes out of nowhere. Did you oh, notice? Oh, yeah, I kind of caught that, yeah. And at first I was like, is it because the the lead of the grapple is like kind of connected to the rope and pulls it along? But then you see this back shot of it, and it's like rope right to hook, but that's not how it fires. Right. Just a little nitpick to me. I'm like, this looks weird. A little off, yeah. That looks a little weird. Uh, our other gadgets, though, we get uh, homing devices. We get the uh, the big homing device that he ends up putting in a car later on. We get a smaller uh, heel size version that right. goes in his shoe. Uh, we also get the classic Mar- uh, Aston Martin DB5 top. Uh. <laughs> There's not better, many better movie cars, I would say. Uh, you, you, you're hard pressed to find one. I mean, if uh, I mean, you know, the Batmobile comes to mind. Those yeah. kind of things, like. It's hard to beat that Aston Martin DB5. And, like, again, it's such a – when you think Bond, you think about that car. Exactly. And it's it's like, the first one that comes to my mind. Exactly. And there are some good cars on down the line, too, don't get me wrong, in this series. Right. But that DB5 is The best, just... of course, being the one from Tomorrow Never Dies, right? Oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, uh, James Bond watch. Uh, James Bond's watch in this film is a Rolex Submariner 6538 as well. Um we're kind of introduced uh, in the beginning a little bit during our, our scene in Miami with Felix. We, we see a couple of uh, Bond girls. We see Dink. Dink. Very briefly. Very briefly we see Dink. She is kind of, I guess, uh, a masseur of some sort. She was kind of giving him a massage, yeah. Yeah. Um, when Felix comes along, she's uh, quickly shuffled away yeah. with a nice little uh, open hand Smack. ass slap. <laughs> uh, man talk, Dink. Uh, man talk, Dink. Run along. Get on out of here. Dink, say goodbye to Felix. Uh, man talk. Uh, before that, oh, we actually forgot one. We have Bonita. She is the... The lady uh, in the overseas yes, country. And yes, and you get yes. that classic. It's in pretty much all Bond compilations you ever see of that 
seeing the goon approaching in the woman's yeah, eyes yeah. and quickly turning her to take the, uh, right. the blackjack to the back of the head because Jimmy gives no Fs about a, <laughs> about a dirty lady <laughs> taking a blackjack <laughs> to the back of the head. I always liked how he looked at the guy. He, just, he fried in the tub, and he's like, shocking. Yes. Then he looks down at her on the way out. Positive, absolutely shocking. Like looking at her, like I can't believe you set me up before we even got down to business. <laughs> yeah, he, just, he just slaps that lamp uh, right into that bathtub, and then we get Jill Masterson who doesn't doesn't make it long. She uh, once Bond gets Judy chopped in the back of the neck, he awakes to uh, her in the bed completely covered in gold paint, which is one of the most iconic I, I think mean, images yeah. of the '60s and film in general. Is exactly. Jill being covered in uh, in paint? He explains to him later she died of skin suffocation because, you know, you're supposed to leave a small open patch and the small of the back, which she didn't. I was just thinking about how long was our job there? <laughs> if he did that job himself, he was there a while. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, if I made a modern-day remake of Goldfinger, I would just have, like, where it looked like he just tossed buckets of gold paint onto her. Right. Like, is how I would execute that scene in modern day because, like, I thought about it. Like, man, Jimmy was out for a while. He was, he was down for a while. Did they bring in a crew? Was it just Odd Job with a little paintbrush, you know, like a house brush? Did they bring in five or six other guys? They're like, oh, let's click, let's paint this bitch and get out of here. <laughs> like, <laughs> Did you catch that little line where uh, he's going back to get the other bottle of Dom Perignon and he's talking about drinking it above a certain temperature it's just not done? Mm -hmm. Kind of like listening to the Beatles without earmuffs. I didn't kinda catch get, that. Yeah, kind of wow. getting a little insinuation that Jimmy ain't too fond of the Beatles. Yeah. <laughs> I can't say that I've listened to uh, too many <laughs> Beatles tracks throughout the years either. He seems more like a classical kind of guy. Yeah, probably, probably so. Um, so what is Goldfinger's actual plan here, Todd? So once we get back to uh, MI6, we kind of have a meeting with uh, EM and Bond and uh, another dignitary type guy. And we kind of learned that they got suspicions that Goldfinger is doing some smuggling. Uh, you know, he's basically taking his gold. It's worth a certain price in this country. He's somehow smuggling into another country and selling it for more than it's worth in his country. They got their suspicions of him. And he, I love how he's actually smuggling the gold in. Tell us how he smuggles his gold in. It's in his car. He's got a, he's got this nice <laughs> ass car, and it's literally all it's all made up of smelted down gold parts. That has to be a heavier car, right? You would think. I mean, that thing's got a waste of stuff. I would just imagine. <laughs> I just like a scene where they're like pulling out of somewhere, and you just see all four tires pop. Just, just go <laughs> under the weight of all that. Under gold the weight of all and the, the gold. car frame. Exactly. Uh, continue about Goldfinger. What else is he up to here? So uh, basically, Bond wants to uh, have a meeting with him. Of course, socially, he always wants to meet his adversary socially. So right. We pick him up at a golf country club. Uh, he gets uh, kind of introduced to Goldfinger, uh, even though he's met him before. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and actually play a round of golf, uh, odd job caddies for Goldfinger, of course. And we get, like, I guess just a standard club caddy for James. Mm -hmm. Yeah, who's very uh, who's very into the the little uh, back and forth him and Goldfinger has. He's very much into He's Bond. eating that stuff up. Yeah, yeah, he's very much into Bond uh, making a fool out of Goldfinger. Yeah, he's like, down for that. There's a point where uh, – uh, uh, Goldfinger hits a bad shot and kind of loses his ball. Odd job drops hit the uh, the golf ball type that he actually uses, which is a, supposed to be a Schlesinger one. Bond has previously found a Schlesinger seven, and uh, they are they're instantly wary of like there's no way that's his ball. And then once James makes the switch to kind of play around and screw uh, Goldfinger over, the caddy's just he's just loving. Him. He loves it. He laughs his ass yeah, off. Yeah, what is that like? <laughs> We've got him now, sir. We got him now. Like sir. I was like, oh, this guy. <laughs> I was really working for his tip today. <laughs> um, but what else do we learn about Goldfinger's actual overall plan as we go forward here, Todd? So we get a name drop of an operation called Operation Grand Slam. Is that at Denny's? <laughs> it's wants, a big breakfast, It's a boy. big breakfast at Denny's. <laughs> and actually, uh, James has to name drop it to save his own skin because we get that other iconic scene where he's strapped down to the table. Yeah, Goldfinger's got that laser coming right towards you. You're going to split him right in two, heading for his crotch. Yeah, there's never, <laughs> again, there's never a compilation of James Bond clips um, that you will never not see that clip in. Again, one of the most iconic yeah. things. Uh, I read something about it was originally supposed to be a buzzsaw. 
Yeah, they um, thought that was kind of too cliched by yeah, now. Yeah, too, too unoriginal, so it changed to the uh, to the the laser. Uh, yeah, but just, just super iconic. Again. Yeah, we, we get that classic line, do you expect me to talk? And he's like, no, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. Exactly. Let me pause right there for a second. I did not know something about this film. I did not know that Goldfinger's voice is dubbed over. It was, yeah. I, I, I did, knew that. Yeah. I never knew that. <laughs> I was going in and doing some research last night and just getting some notes and stuff for, you know, the, we do some Bond bits later on. And I was like, what? I was I was like, this guy's voice was uh, was dubbed over completely by another actor because I guess um, uh, Gert Frobe, who plays mm-hmm. Goldfinger, uh, his English wasn't as good. Uh, there's clips on YouTube, and I'll actually put in a, a clip of uh, – Gert Frobe's actual voice line from a trailer that they use. I'll put that in here. I think you've made your point, Goldfinger. Thank you for the demonstration. Choose your next witnesses and carefully, Mr. Bond. It may be your last. Do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond. I expect you to buy. And, um... I went back and listened to that clip. His uh, real voice sounds even better to me. Right. You'll have to check out that clip if you hadn't, but I okay. never knew. I would have never, unless you told me, I would have never knew that his voice was dubbed it's over. It's a very film. seamless dub, too. You, you, if you didn't know it, you wouldn't know it. Exactly. But continue, Ty. What's our uh, what's our ultimate goal here? So uh, Bond's, you know, he's getting ready to die. We've got the laser heading straight up his, up his, up his straddle. <laughs> <laughs> And he's trying to figure out how to get out of this. And he's like, well, what about uh, what about Operation Grand Slam? If I get killed, 008 replaces me. He knows what I know. There was uh, something I read, too, about people uh, always uh, thought that that line about Goldfinger, where Goldfinger says he would be replaced by his... Um I can't remember how he phrases it. Like he would... his Not his better, but like basically the line people thought that he meant that he would be replaced by another like double O from MI6 and that like MI6 was compromised. Do you Mm -hmm. know what I'm talking about? Do you know that line I'm talking about? I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. But like I was reading like it, like it's actually supposed to be that he just meant like that someone else from like another organization, you know, would try to attempt the same kind of thing. Not that MI6 had been breached, so to speak. Just something I read. I wish I could remember the line. I can't because I suck. Anyway, (laughs) continue. And so uh, James, of course, names drop Operation Grand Slam, and, you know, he's like, you know, they know what I know. I know about it. They know about it. And Goldfinger kind of pauses, and he's like, yeah, it's probably just something you've heard. Two words that don't mean nothing to you. And he's like, yeah, but can you take that chance? Right. And Goldfinger's like, mm, maybe I can. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and we got a little bit ahead of ourselves because when we get to, I think it was Geneva, Switzerland. Switzerland, yes. yes we, that we is some to... of the most beautiful. That winding road, those yeah. mountains, that scenery is amazing. Yeah, I was actually going <laughs> to, yeah, I was uh, I was actually thinking about that when I was watching. I'm like, this is probably the most stylistically and visually interesting of the first three Sean Connery films. But you're right, the, the stuff in yeah. Geneva. And we should we should set up, too, a little bit of her character because she, she's not in it very long. No, nope, she don't uh, hang around often. We, we get we get Jill Masterson at the beginning. She was obviously killed by, um, you know, suffocated with the, the gold paint uh james kind of meets along the uh the trail in switzerland while trailing goldfinger he meets um a, a lady named tilly uh he ends up using his one of his gadgets in the car which is kind of like uh i guess a way to destroy tires it kind of jets out of his rims right uh, he ends up destroying not only her front tire uh most of the the quarter panel side panel all the way back to, <laughs> to the other back tire. to the other back tire <laughs> which i'd have been a little sus i've i've never they remarked that they've never seen anything like that and no no one else has in history because <laughs> His car actually did it. Uh, but he ends up giving her a ride to the next like kind of gas station. He notices a TM written on her her little uh, case in the back. Yeah, and she gives him like a fake name. And he's yeah. like, you know, he knows that doesn't match up to the initials on that case. I really liked, and I'll, I'll kind of wonder too if it was um, kind of a callback that I never thought about. I don't know if it actually is, but when she first kind of uh, – is in Switzerland, she kind of like is trying to pass him in the car and she's like going around him. He's like, you hear the engine rev and he's like, discipline 007, discipline. He right. doesn't kind of chase her. And I was thinking, is it a callback later on in GoldenEye when he does chase uh, on a top? On a top. I was like, is that kind of, it's a very similar in a way because yeah. he does in, indulge in the in the chase there and does kind of chase after the girl. Right. So Could I was be. like, I was like, is that a, is that a callback to GoldenEye? I guess maybe when we get around 
around to Goldeneye, maybe we'll find we'll out. We'll find out. Some of a the, nod, yeah. Behind the scenes. But uh, the, the lady he gives a, uh, a ride to is actually Tilly Masterson, uh, daughter, not daughter, but sister of Jill Masterson. Uh, she actually ends up taking a shot. You think she's taking a shot at James later on, uh, but uh, she's actually trying to hit Goldfinger, and it's like the worst shot ever. We just find out she's a horrible shot. Yeah, she's a horrible <laughs> shot, but she doesn't stick around long in a scene where uh, in one of the one of the chase scenes, it's probably the big chase scene in the movie, uh, I guess they're in, is it Arc Enterprises at that point where yeah, they're at? Yeah, yeah. Uh, James has to end up escaping with her, and there's like a car chase, and he's being chased by uh, all of Goldfinger's kind of, I guess, they're, they're like Southeast Asian goons. Yeah. He's got, a, I guess, because we'll see later on that uh, some of the Chinese had uh, kind of shipped in his goons from overseas, but it's a lot of Southeast Asian guys chasing Bond, chasing Tilly in the car. You get a great use of uh, the gadgets on the car. You get the, uh, like the smoke screen. You get the oil slick. Right. I, I really love the oil slick because one of the, the goon uh, cars hits the oil slick, goes off a hill, and explodes for no reason. <laughs> did you did you notice that? It's not on fire. It's not been shot. It hits some oil on the ground. Goes over goes the over, side. Boom, boom. It's just, I was like, oh, that's that's the 60s, baby. That's how we roll in the 60s. Um, but eventually Bond and Jill are kind of cornered. Uh, he tells her to run on his signal. She runs towards it in the woods. Here comes Odd Job with his uh, with his uh, steel brimmed hat, though, just thrown through the woods right into Tilly's neck. Yeah, kills her. And she's not in the movie long. You think, kind of at first, you think, is she going to be hanging around? Is she our like main love interest that James is going to be in the final scene somewhere uh, with uh, while someone else discovers him, and they just be like, uh, "We're, we're going to have sex. You go away." <laughs> <laughs> like, like he does at the end of For Russia with Love and right. all these other films. Like, no, she's uh, she's taken out. Pretty quickly. Both Masterson sisters are removed from the film very quickly. As, mm-hmm. as Almost as quickly as they're introduced, they're taken out of the film. Yeah, they're gone. All right, Todd. So what is Operation Grand Slam really? So basically Operation Grand Slam is uh, Goldfinger's master plan to uh, – he's got uh, Delta-9 nerve gas, which is deadly, by the way. Yeah. He's going to use a uh, aerial assault. We'll get into who leads that assault just a little bit later here. <laughs> All right. Uh, he's going to knock out everyone in and around Fort Knox. Uh, he's going to use the laser that he used to uh, intimidate James Bond to kind of cut into the side of the building, get into Fort Knox. We find out he's got a nuclear device, and he's not going to break in to steal any gold. He's going to detonate that little device and make – the uh, United States Gold Reserve useless for like, I think he said 58 years. 58 years, yeah. The plan is not to move the gold, to take it, to steal it, it's to irradiate it, to make it useless, basically. Thereby making his gold supply worth 10 times more. Exactly, and sowing despair and uh, distress into the West as well. I was uh, I was looking at it last night, and I was like, I wonder if anybody, because on, on its face, just thinking about it, me being uh, the uneducated chap that I am, I was like, <laughs> Like, that's a good plan. That's a it's a good movie plan. Right. Like right. it's a, a fantastic movie plan. Like is it really uh is it really uh feasible? Uh I was actually looking up some articles last night to see if anyone had really kind of broken it down. Um I just kind of had some notes here um, from a site that I'd found that uh you know one of the the big th- problems with Goldfinger's like uh, plan is that the, the gold really doesn't need to be touched by anybody for it to still be viable for the economy. Right. Uh, and also uh, the note here that I have, were this not enough, the radiation would uh, not be a permanent effect. Goldfinger admitted the gold would be rendered useless for 58 years. However, this calculation was not quite correct due to only one isotope of gold having a nuclear half-life of more than a few days. The gold would have actually been safe within one month. Wow. <laughs> So not too viable. That month though, it'd have been hell. That'd have been a hell of a month, <laughs> Goldfinger. You got us. You got right. us for a month. But after that, my guy, we're fine. But as a diabolical movie plot, wow. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. That, and that's all it needs to be. And like, you don't need to really think about it. It works narratively. And then, like, as far as a Bond movie plot, like, it's 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 really good. And yeah. there's a nice scene where Bond and, and Goldfinger are talking about it, and he kind of lets Bond figure out the plan. And it's really good narrative little driven scene there that I like. Right. Who is it that um, does pull off the uh, the distribution of the Delta-9 gas, Todd? So after uh, Goldfinger decides to let Bond hang around and live, uh, they trank him. 
we see Bon kind of waking up. Uh, he's kind of visions coming and going. We kind of get the vision of a lady in front of him. And uh, imagine, yeah, and uh, imagine that, right? And she introduces herself as Pussy Galore. <laughs> Again, <laughs> another you'll never see a James Bond compilation where you don't see that. My name is Pussy Galore. Exactly. Like you'll like, never. I must be dreaming. <laughs> exactly. And for a series that is known for like you know. Uh, kind of on the nose women names Here's has there ever been one more spot on no. or in your face than pussy galore no, no, no. way <laughs> exactly and that again that might be a subtle uh symptom of problems to come it like it still works here right. uh, somehow i don't know how it works here but it does <laughs> it does in other movies where like they really lean into that stuff especially in the more era Exactly. Um, yeah. It really gets a little too ridiculous. Obviously, that's why you get parodies like Austin Powers with like a lot of for China and <laughs> random tasks and stuff. Because like I think the 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 producers and like the directors of these these films later on, they just kind of pulled on some of this stuff and kind of like, what is Bond? Let's throw it in a blender. Oh, it's really kind of some crass innuendo and kind of right. crazy names and gadgets. Exactly. And, it, and you lose, like you said, you lose the good espionage stuff that this started out on. So Goldfinger is an amazing film, but it is a little bit of a double-edged sword when it's it comes to... kind of the to, beginning of a drop-off. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, so uh, take us through the the very end of the film here, Todd. How do we, how do we wrap things up? So uh, Bond being Bond, uh, he manages to convince Pussy Galore to uh, not disperse that Delta Nine nerve gas over uh, Fort Knox. Uh, something is dispersed, but I don't think it maybe this you know this regular gas. Maybe right. it was empty tanks. Who knows? Right. But we kind of get our first nod that something's not quite right to plan when we see Felix Leiter kind of knocked out one of those vehicles. Mm -hmm. uh, they're at Fort Knox. Goldfinger thinks he's going ahead with his plan, but you know the military revives their back. Uh, they show up to kind of stop the plan. Uh, you kind of get a notion that Goldfinger is maybe thinking something might go south because he rips off the clothes he had on to reveal a U.S. military uniform, uh, puts on a little hat, pulls out a golden pistol. So is yes. he the first man with a golden gun? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you know, Bond is uh, left there chained to the nuclear device. He's trying to figure out how to shut it off. Uh, before that, he has a little bit of a battle with Odd Job after he gets the keys to the cuff and releases himself. Uh, iconic scene where uh, Odd Job throws his hat. It gets uh, caught in those metal bars. There was a little bit of a scene earlier where he throws it and like kind of disconnects a power cable. Mm -hmm. uh, Odd Job goes for his bowler. As soon as he reaches for it, Bond slides in with that power cable and electrifies the bars, just shocking him to death. Another another shot you'll see in all Bond yeah, compilations. You always see Again, that shot. this is like this is the apex, really. Like it never. You just go iconic scene, iconic yep. scene, iconic. Scene. Absolutely. So Bond is free. Uh, he's trying desperately to shut off that nuclear device. He's, he's pulling that wires, looking at this, looking at that. We kind of see, like, I guess a government agent come down. He just kind of flips a switch. <laughs> of course, we get the little shot of the timer, and what's it stop on, Cody? 007, 007 baby. baby. Yeah, I, was, I read that they were wanting it to stop on, like, three, but the, some, one of the producers was like, it needs to be on 007, and it does. It yeah, does. That, that's it does. Just, as, as iconic, it works. It works. <laughs> it absolutely works. Um, one, one thing we were talking about before the podcast I didn't really, I didn't really think about, um, you had a note kind of about uh, the characterization of Pussy Galore and maybe some uh, kind of uh, under the surface stuff that may have not been noticed. Uh, go yeah, into that. Uh, if you're not, if you like a lot of the audience that maybe watch these movies, and me and Cody definitely, you know the movies, you don't know the books. Yeah. And uh, there's kind of. By the a, way, this is the seventh uh, in the Ian Fleming James Bond series, by the way, the seventh book. So when they're on our Goldfinger's private jet, I think they're flying to his stud farm in Kentucky, uh, you know. James is already in full Bond mode trying to do the wooey and the pitchy. <laughs> <laughs> right. And uh, she kind of, I forget what he says to her, and she kind of turns back and gives him this line is, you know, you can drop all the charm. I'm immune. And, mm -hmm. you know, her entire flying circus is all female. Yes. So with you, very pointy bras. By with the way. very pointy. You put an eye out with them, babies. Exactly. Uh, so, but we do learn in the novel that, uh, you know, Pussy Glory was a lesbian. 
And, and I, you kind of get that insinuation in the movie just from those lines. Yes. Which makes the scene in the barn. <laughs> when, when, when Bond forces himself upon her. Yeah. And she begrudgingly goes with it. Yeah, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's the power of double not seven, baby. <laughs> that's the power of sexual assault, <laughs> baby. <laughs> oh, Lord. Uh, uh, Todd, you want some Bond bits here? Yeah. You ready for some Bond Let's bits all up in you? Uh-huh. No. <laughs> uh, the movie was the fastest grossing movie in movie history when it was released and was entered into the Guinness Book of World Records. Aston Martin was initially reluctant to part with two of their cars for the production. The producers had to pay for the Aston Martin, but after the success of the movie, both at the box office and for the company, they never had to spend money on a car again. Nice. Imagine that. Oh, yeah. Uh, something we forgot to mention, the classic ejector seat scene. Oh, yeah. And the the line delivery earlier in the film where Q shows him the ejector seat, and it's like, a check to seat, you're joking. <laughs> Again, another iconic line, another iconic scene. Right. Exactly. But another told- iconic moment that shows up later where Bond actually goes to Q's lab to draw his weaponry. Instead of Q coming to M's lab, yes. You that see one. all those little side gags or like somebody getting shot with a bulletproof coat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would hate to be the guy testing that out. <laughs> Uh, when Dame Shirley Bassey recorded the theme song, uh, we kind of mentioned this before, she was singing the opening credits uh, were running on the screen in front of her so that she could match the vocals. When she hit her final high note, the titles kept running, and she was forced to hold the note until she almost passed out, and it echoes the experience of Sir Tom Jones when he was recording the Thunderball 1965 theme as yeah. well. go for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was something I thought was crazy. Sir Sean Connery never traveled to the United States to film this movie. I saw that. Every yeah. scene in which he appears to be in the U.S. was filmed at Pinewood Studios outside London. This explains why Bond uh, flips a light switch down to discover the golden corpse of Jill, as British light switches are generally turned on by flicking them down instead of up. According to director Guy Hamilton, that's something we should mention too. Guy Hamilton takes over from Terence Young here, right. our first uh a director for Dr. No and for um, from, Russia. from Russia with Love. He would come back later, I think, to do The Man with the Golden Gun. He does Thunderball, if I'm not... Was it Thunderball? Hang on one second. I have the note here of Guy Hamilton. Guy Hamilton will come back to direct Diamonds Are Forever, Live and Let Die, and The Man with the Golden Gun. But Terrence, uh, Terrence Young would come back for uh, for Thunderball. Um, Let me see here. Lost my place. Ooh, there, there we go. <laughs> uh, according to director Guy Hamilton, uh, Felix was the only main actor in the Miami sequence who was actually there. Connery, Gert Frobe, Shirley Eaton, Margaret Nolan, so on and so forth, uh, all filmed their parts when filming started in Britain with rear projections used, and in the case of Frobe, uh, stand-ins used for the long shots. You would have... I'd have never have known you that. Never known it. Never have known. Did you like how uh, when Jill is looking at uh, Goldfinger like cheating and Bond is like you know, screwing with him, he like snaps that pencil and you hear it snap? Right. You couldn't hear that. You snap. couldn't have heard. You that couldn't snap. heard that snap. <laughs> uh, this was the first appearance of a laser beam in a 007 movie, and we mentioned it was a buzz saw originally. Uh, the recreation of Fort Knox repository at Pinewood Studios was incredibly accurate, considering no one involved in this movie had been allowed inside the real location for security reasons. The set looked so real that 24-hour guard was placed on the Fort Knox set at Pinewood Studios so that uh, pilferers would not steal the gold bar props. A letter to the production from the Fort Knox controller congratulated Sir Ken Adam and his team on the recreation. Art Goldfinger's 3D model map used for his Operation Grand Slam is now housed as a permanent exhibition at the real Fort Knox. That is cool. Uh, Pussy Galore, Honor Blackman, introduces herself to James Bond, Sir Sean Connery, who replies, I must be dreaming. The original script had Bond replying, I know you are, but what's your name? Oh. Yeah. Mm. That's a little bit too much on the name. I didn't, I didn't know she was from The Avengers. <laughs> I, I, I saw some of that show, but I, I remember hearing that, but I never saw any episodes with her on it. I, Apparently I did, she quit the show to do the movie. Exactly, yeah. yes. Um, the line was deemed so suggestive and was changed or bleeped in some markets around the world, especially for the country of India. Uh, we talked about it before that Gert Frobe's uh, voice was dubbed over. He spoke very little English, and uh, British actor Michael Collins dubbed his voice in the film. Um... The producers wanted Orson Welles to play Oric Goldfinger, but Welles was too expensive. Then Gert Fro began arguing over his salary. He wanted 10% from the movie's earnings, prompting the producers to wonder whether Welles would have been cheaper after all. <laughs> 
Uh, Ian, Fim, uh, Ian Fleming partially based the title character of his original 1959 novel Goldfinger on the controversial modernist architect Erno Goldfinger. When he learned that Fleming was naming the villain of his new James Bond novel Goldfinger, the architect threatened to file a lawsuit against Fleming's publisher in an effort to stop the book's publication. Fleming's publisher then contacted the author to inquire whether Fleming might consider renaming the character and the novel. Fleming replied that he'd been delighted to alter the name if he could change the name of the character in the novel to Gold Prick. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, a little, uh, something I didn't include here, but uh, I understand Ian Fleming got to visit the set of Goldfinger, but he never actually got it to see completion. I think he died a few months before it was actually right. released, which is unfortunate because I think, again, this was the apex. He missed the best one, yeah. Exactly. Um, and, uh, the last note I had, we kind of hit it on here. Uh, you kind of beat me to it. The uh, Goldfinger does wear yellow items or golden items of clothing in virtually every scene. And the one scene that he appears not to, which you know, wears a U.S. Colonel's army uniform, he carries a golden revolver. Thus, in the chronology of James Bond films, he's the first man with a golden gun. He was. And we totally forgot about his death, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, uh, we did totally forget about. It. But we, he's, he gets sucked out of a he plane. He gets sucked out of a side yeah. of an airplane. Yeah, there's a yeah. He gets sucked out of a plane. That's uh, <laughs> that's uh, the 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 ending there, folks. Right. Um. So, Todd, uh, anything else? Final thoughts wise. I had a little note. Uh, it's uh, what I like to call the Bond Trinity, and that is uh, Bernard Lee as M, uh, Lois Maxwell as Money Penny, and Desmond Llewellyn as Q. Uh, they were mainstays on this series through three Bond eras, uh, Connery, Lazenby, and Moore. I think we lost Bernard Lee somewhere in the Moore era. Mm -hmm. uh, just all three tremendous actors. Uh, any of their scenes with uh, any 007 are just, are just awesome. Yeah, uh, three three greats. The OGs. You can't ever hardly ever beat the OGs, folks. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Their their interplay. You know the, the the dynamic between M and Q. It's a little. It's um, you know, it's friendly, and there's a little bit of there's there's that. It's kind of like uh, there's a little bit of that boss subordinate but it's also right. like you can tell they've been through some stuff and they have a, a little little bit of quippy exchange uh kind of especially when bond is like uh showing off uh about knowing like that bourbon i think they're drinking with the the guy from the bank yeah like just little little yeah. scenes like that are yeah, great he, he, M never you know loses a chance to chastise bond a little bit if he can it, exactly it's, just, it's a great dynamic <laughs> exactly so todd uh you ready to give us your review for goldfinger i'm ready all right hit us with it uh, folks, we've hit the top of the mountain here, in my opinion. Uh, we can maintain at times. Uh, we kind of rise close to, and unfortunately, sometimes we fall below. But I don't think we ever reach the heights that we reach at Goldfinger here. Uh, it's just one iconic scene after another, one iconic image, location, uh, stellar cast. Uh, this one's worth its weight in gold, <laughs> pun intended. Uh, Goldfinger, for me, gets a nine. It is an amazing Bond movie. Yeah, I echo all that. It is uh, the apex of the Bond franchise. It is gives us probably the most iconic or some of the most iconic scenes in all of James Bond history. Uh, it's a fantastic film. It works on every level. There's a few things that you could nitpick here or there, but as far as a, a, a narrative-driven James Bond film with some still some good espionage and it builds some things that would stay with the character for the next 50-plus years, it absolutely hits everything that it sets out to do. I agree with you. I also give it a 9 out of 10, which which ranks it as amazing. Uh, so, Todd, can you tell everyone how they can find us and stay up to date with us on social media? We are at Tao Capes on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. Tao Capes Podcast on Facebook. You can also email us at TaoCapesPod at gmail.com. Uh, if you enjoy the show, please consider following us on your podcast platform of choice and uh, subscribing to our YouTube channel. Popcorn Mumbles will return next week. We want to thank you so much for listening. Until next time, bye, guys. See you, guys. <laughs>